Hello church, my name is Trey Fraley and I'm on the pastor's team at Redemption Church Arcadia. We are looking forward to the time that we get to see you in person. And although some things have changed, our cause of church has not. We remain gospel-centered and outward focused and we believe that all of life is all for Jesus. We've heard a lot of questions about how people can help and get involved with being outward focused and serving. And there's two main ways that uh, we can do that. Number one is just giving a little bit more financially to our general funds so that we can get to people in need. Number two is donating supplies. We've uh, teamed up with some organizations that are uh, able to distribute those supplies. And if you need any more information on that and you want to know more of that list, uh, go to our website at arcadia.redemptionaz.com. So we're going to sing to proclaim God's goodness and his righteousness. We're going to look to God's word to shape us, asking the spirit to bear fruit in our lives. And although we're not together physically, we do ask that you would stay in contact with us through uh, texts and calls and emails. Thank you so much for joining us this weekend online. Let's worship.
tomb where soldiers watched in vain was borrowed for three days his body there would not remain our god has robbed the grave our god has robbed Today's reading is Matthew 6, 5 through 15. The Lord's Prayer. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for, many, for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray them like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. This is the word of the Lord. Hello, Redemption Arcadia. It's good to be with you again virtually. Uh, <laughs> I'm starting to feel a little bit more like my old self, so right out of the gate. A word about the word virtually. Think about how we use that word, virtually. The way we use it in sentences means almost, or not quite, or not actually real, or not really real. So this whole idea of having virtual relationships and thinking we're gonna be satisfied by those, having virtual community, having virtual communication, think about that. We are, in a sense, having community and relationship and communication. But really seriously consider that. Uh, the word virtual means not really, not complete, not holistic, not as good as it can be. It's a perception of reality. So just remember that as we do this. We're glad we have the technology to be able to come at you this way and, and maintain relationship. But man, we are missing those times of actually being together, really being together with no virtual about it. So we're looking forward to being able to get back together with you again. If you would please get your Bibles and have them ready to go. Uh, we are in the Lord's Prayer. We're, we're doing it out of Matthew chapter 6. And you've already heard the readings, so you don't necessarily have to go there. The first passage we're actually going to look at Eventually, it's going to take a few minutes for me to get there, but eventually we're going to look first at Ezekiel chapter 2, then we'll be in Proverbs chapter 30, and we're going to end with Philippians chapter 4, just to let you know. Again, you can always pause the video in order to find those, uh, those references when, when we get there. But we're in Lord's Prayer, week 4 of 6. I do want you to remember that right before Jesus begins to recite the Lord's Prayer, he says this, when you pray, Understand that your father knows exactly what you need before you ask. So pray like this. 
And the reason Jesus says that is not so that you and I can say, well, then what's the point in praying? He doesn't say that at all. We need to be in relationship with God, and we still need to go with him with our petitions and our requests and our adoration and our praise. But the reason he's saying that is that when we pray, we should pray with both confidence and a sense of dependency on him. We should pray with confidence that he's going to hear us, but also understanding that we are dependent upon him and him alone. He is our provision and our sustenance. And what we're going to look at today in the prayer is primarily about provision and sustenance. So pray with confidence, but also pray with a sense of dependency. Two weeks ago, before Easter, uh, we looked at verse 10, which was your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we went through uh, all the differences between God's kingdom and our kingdom and God's will and our will and had a great time with that. Uh, that verse ends, however, we need to see this, the first half of the prayer, which is all about God, you first. Remember that this prayer begins with, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. The prayer doesn't start with, hey God, here I am, here's who I am, and here's what I want. We acknowledge who God is, we acknowledge his sovereignty and his authority first, and then once we're properly oriented towards God and we understand our relationship with him, who he is and who we are, that's when we can actually start to make requests of him. Requests of our legitimate, genuine needs and not just wants that we have turned into needs somehow, miraculously, by our own manipulation. So today, uh, we begin the request part of the prayer. It's verse 11 and it starts with this. Lord, give us this day our daily bread. Give us today, notice the limitations there, our daily bread. And the request is for bread. And it's not just bread. We should understand that. We're going to get into that in a second. It's not just bread, but it's an idea of what the bread represents. So today, we talk about the request for our basic, genuine, legitimate needs in our life. That's what we talk about today. Next week, when we talk about forgiveness, we talk about the legitimate and genuine need for us to be in right relationships with God and with others and how important that is. And then finally, the last week, when we talk about our debts or our sins or... Um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, not, not when we talk about our debts and our sins. I'm, I, when we start talking about delivering us from evil... I naturally think of debts and sins and transgressions when, when the term evil comes up because they are evil and they're wicked. But when we talked to God about that last week about being delivered from evil, being delivered from wickedness, being delivered from our own sinful desires and the, and the corruption of this world, we are talking about our genuine need for deliverance, for reconciliation with you, for redemption and restoration. So those are our three genuine needs that we're going to look at these next uh, three weeks. So let's talk a little bit about bread. Uh, bread stands for, symbolizes, or references a number of things. I'm going to talk about five of them today, and only five. There are actually more beyond the five, but I'm going to talk about five. And let me just say, I, I've heard this from some of you in the past, uh, over the years. If you are a note taker and you like lists in sermons, this sermon is for you. This is your wheelhouse. You're going to love this because I've got a list and I've got lots of things that we can take notes on. And we need to understand that these things that the, the bread symbolizes, we need them daily. Give us this day our daily bread. Those are the keys to this request here. So they're daily, daily. Uh, by the way, just as an aside, I have a lot of asides today. Uh, think about the timeliness of us working through this prayer right now. Six months ago, this prayer, I think, would have had uh, uh, virtually no relevance or impact to us. It would have been fun to work through it, and yes, it's a great prayer and all that. But think about the relevance and impact today. Today, I found it, uh, by today, I mean the current context we're in, I found it not unusual to walk into uh, any Safeway and go to the bread aisle and find that there is absolutely no bread available to purchase, none. I could have $100 and waving it around, no bread available to purchase. And I know it's the same thing with, at times with toilet paper and with 
paper towels. I've even discovered, I don't know why, I am having a very hard time finding Mystic Mango Kombucha. I can't find my kombucha even. I don't know when that became an essential item for people, but I mean, it's a different time that we live in today. When we go through all the trouble of getting into our car and getting masked up and all that to go to the grocery store, there's no guarantee that what we're looking for, staple items are gonna be there. There's some real relevance now with this prayer, and I think you get my point. Seeing no bread on the shelves feels threatening to our provision and our sustenance. And it's true. It is in a physical, horizontal, temporal way. It is a threat to our our provision and sustenance. And so, Lord God, help us today. We are now forced to look to God for our provision and sustenance. So here we go, our list of five in that first metaphor, that first symbol that bread is for, is for provision and sustenance. That's probably the biggest one. Uh, In in their context, in Jesus' context, bread, every time you brought up bread, it was instantly recognizable because of its staple status. They had bread at almost every, uh, it seems, if not every single meal that they would have. I've read in a couple of different places that in ancient Israel, say, for instance, the first century, it was not uncommon for somebody for their breakfast to be to grab a piece of bread dip it in wine, and then nibble on it as they're walking out the door. And every time I read that, I think about how many of us today have an affection for toast with preserves on it. And, and that's something that maybe a form of that has been happening for years. But it's, it's a staple of life. It, 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 it's a part of their life that was around all the time. And so whenever somebody said bread, they instantly thought of all these different things. Even Jesus says in John chapter 6, verse 35, I am the bread of life. Jesus is our sustenance. Uh, Consider the language that we use even today around the word bread, this idea of being a breadwinner. So if somebody ever asked you, you know, who's the breadwinner in your home? And of course, most homes now have more than one breadwinner, but there's there's usually one person who... uh, wins more bread than anybody else, if you want to put it that way. But the word breadwinner is not just this idea of going out and winning bread. You don't, when you hear breadwinner, you don't conjure up the picture of somebody coming home at the end of the day, and and they're all sort of beaten up and, 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 you know, disheveled and everything, but they walk into the house and they say, I got the bread, and they're holding up a loaf of bread. That's not what we're thinking. The idea of being a breadwinner, it means that you're providing for everything that you need for sustenance in the household. It's food, it's shelter, it's clothing, it's medicine, it's all those things. Back in the day, we don't do it so much anymore today, but back in the day, I remember we used to call money bread. I'm sure you guys remember that, right? We call money bread, you know? And, and we didn't think it was literal bread, but rather we, re- we understood that money represents all that we can do with it, kind of the way bread is, is, is so... Um, Uh, in so many ways can be used for so many different things. It can be used in sandwiches. It can be made as toast. There's different things that you can do with bread. And so back in the day, when we'd say something like, well, we're out of bread, what we were communicating was that we couldn't do anything anymore because bread, back in the day, represented uh, something that we could use to be able to go and do things. So it, it, it's provision, it's sustenance, it's activity, it's, it's behavior, it's being able to do things. I even, went, I even went here, sorry. Some of you will have no idea what I'm talking about. Just hang in there for a minute. But those of you from my generation, you'll understand this. A few of you might remember the 70s and 80s soft rock group known as Bread. That's what their name was. And so I thought about this. I thought, oh man, there's a rock group named Bread. There must be some deep, significant meaning to the fact that they called themselves Bread. I really thought I had something, so I looked up why they ended up calling their band Bread, and it's really a fascinating story. They came up with the name one day when in Southern California, their lead vocalist and guitarist were in a car, and they were stuck in a traffic jam behind, yes, a Wonder Bread truck. And the two of them looked at each other and said, hey, Bread, let's call ourselves Bread. Really deep and helpful, so anyway. The idea of Bread, in their context and in ours. In their context, meaning in Israel's first century context. It's important because it symbolizes provision and sustenance, 
But also, because it symbolizes provision and sustenance, that means it points us to something beyond that, which is trust and a sense of security. So this idea of provision and sustenance points us even beyond to trust and a sense of security. It's the fact that God is reliable. It's the fact that God is our true breadwinner, and he will provide for us what we need. Now, let's talk about what we need. He'll provide for us what we need. Here's the problem with that, especially in our culture and and, in our expectations and in our lifestyles today. What he provides for us may not be steak and a Mercedes. We're going to have to understand that. What he provides for us may be ramen noodles and a 1970 Ford Pinto. Pinto. But we're going to be okay as, as long as nobody hits you from behind in the Pinto. We're going to be okay with the ramen noodles and the Pinto. Um, what he provides for us may not be a kale salad and a craft beer, although I have, no, I have no idea why anybody would ever eat those together. But at any rate, it may not be a kale salad and a craft beer or a craft salad and a kale beer. Whatever it is, it may be a Safeway salad kit and an A&W, but we're going to be okay. Even consider this. I want you to think about this. Um, I was in a discussion with uh, all the lead pastors and preaching pastors during our preaching collective, and this came up. When was the last time any of us drank tap water? When was the last time any of us actually drank tap water? You know, when I was a kid, that's all we ever drank. And we were glad to have it. And and we didn't think twice about it. And look, I'm 61 and I'm still okay. I drank tap water. I remember, I remember when bottled water started becoming a thing. And by the way, yeah, I drink bottled water now. My refrigerator is full of bottled water, of course. I have to be cool like all the other kids. But, but I remember when bottled water became a thing, we're all looking around going, why? Why are you taking the water, putting it into a plastic bottle, which is not good for the environment, and then paying more than gasoline for it? Why? Why would you do that? But now we can't drink water unless it's bottled or filtered or or 30,000 years ago was an iceberg somewhere. We have to uh, think about that. Most of us would consider it primitive suffering if we actually had to drink tap water. And yet there are places in this world that would be so thankful if they had our tap water. We need some perspective. We need to be very careful about how bad we think we have it. I mean, how bad do we really think we have it? See, here's the thing. This prayer does not say, God, give us this day our daily lifestyle that I desire and deserve. That's not what it says. It says, give us this day our daily bread. We need to understand that. What we need in our lives is less lifestyle creep and more gospel creep. And what I mean by that is, when we start to push into living life a certain way and all the pleasures and joys that come from that, which is fine, but it never really fully satisfies us and so there's this sort of momentum that just is constantly going for more, more, more. That's called lifestyle creep, okay? Uh, At one time you were thinking, if I could just get a car that was only five years ago, that would be like nirvana, okay? And, and now some people are like, no, the only thing I can drive is a brand new car and I'll drive it for two years and that's it. We, we, we got to understand lifestyle creep. We need less of that and we need more gospel creep. We need more of the gospel creeping into our lives, more of an understanding of where our bread comes from and who our bread really is. Here's the second thing that the bread represents. When Jesus said bread, they also knew it was a reference to manna. By the way, just so you understand, when Jesus said to his audience in their context, Give us this day our daily bread. He knew that the audience knew all of these things that we're talking about, that the bread represented all of these things. Well, the second thing it represents is this manna. If you recall Exodus, we just finished the book of Exodus last fall. It's the Old Testament gospel story. God rescues his people from slavery in Egypt, and he brings them miraculously through the Red Sea, and he brings them into the wilderness. But there... In the wilderness, the people start to complain. Kind of like you and I during lockdown, during this pandemic, complaining. And I know that this has been very hard for many people, this lockdown. I understand all of the trouble, all the inconveniences, all the emotional hurt that this lockdown has happened. I get it. And I'm not, I'm not trying to be flipper and sensitive about this, but we need to understand that we're also learning quite a bit 
from this lockdown that we never would have learned had this lockdown not happened. So maybe we should look at this lockdown through those eyes, which I'll talk about in just a few minutes. And yet, in the midst of this lockdown, there are so many people, a lot of people, many of them Christians, who only want to talk about getting back to normal. This has been this phrase that I hear all the time. I can't wait till we get back to normal. So a couple of words about that. Do you guys remember when it was normal? Remember that? Like eight weeks ago, it was normal. Do you remember how much we whined and complained then? That's the normal that we would all like to get back to. That normal that we were miserable about, that we were tired of, that we had complaints about. That's the normal that we would like to get back. We seem to be viewing that normal through a different lens today, the lockdown lens. I hope that we remember that when that happens because now we're remembering how good we had it. Here's the second thing. We need to remember that normal is not God's kingdom. Getting back to normal means getting back to our kingdoms, our sinful, corrupt, failed kingdoms that we talked about two weeks ago. So when we say, I can't wait to get back to normal, what you're saying is, I can't wait to get back to my little kingdom. That's what we're saying. And for those of you who haven't considered this yet, I mentioned this, but for those of you who haven't considered this yet, what is God teaching you and I in all of this? Uh, Here's some examples. For instance, haven't our idols been exposed, the idols of our hearts our false gods, haven't those been exposed pretty well to us? Hasn't it, haven't we also learned that we really do need Sabbath? We need, we need rest and we need leisure. We need slowness. We need quietude. You know, one of the most common things I've heard from people in the midst of this is sentences that start with this. I am never again going to take for granted and then fill in the blank. I hear that all the time. I hope we remember that when things do sort of start to get back to normal. It seems as though we're also learning that real community and real relationships are more important than we ever realized. Yes, even for introverts. And also, I believe that we've we've learned that um, Ticket to Ride is a much better game than Settlers of Catan, and Amazon Prime is better than Netflix. We've all learned these, these very important lessons. Anyway... After God's people bitterly complained about the wonderful delights of the cuisine that they left behind in Egypt in their slavery, God says in Exodus chapter 16, verse 4, well, I will rain bread from heaven. I will rain bread from heaven, and that's the manna. That's not the only thing that they ate, but the daily manna was a tangible, real representation of the larger, genuine concerns of provision and sustenance. That's what we have to understand. The manna wasn't just this wonderful, some sort of sweet wafer type uh, substance that was really good to eat, but, but it was representing the fact that God is a God of provision and sustenance. It, it was letting the people know that they have nothing to be anxious about, that he's there, that he's gonna provide, and that he is not gonna leave them, and he's not gonna leave us. So it's about trust and security and hope you know, uh, we're in a type of wilderness right now. Wouldn't, wouldn't you describe this lockdown and this pandemic as a type of wilderness? It's a wilderness. Here's what God said to his people back then, and I think it applies to us now as well. He says this in Deuteronomy 8, as they are finally coming out of the wilderness. I think he wants us to remember the same thing when we finally start to come out of this wilderness. He writes this in Deuteronomy 8. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know that what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known to teach you that man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of the Lord. So so God taught his people for 40 years humility and that true sustenance comes from him and not just from having enough food, physical food to eat. So seriously, think about what is it that God is teaching us right now in the midst of this pandemic? But, but there's another side to this too. We also need to remember that this is not just God giving us stuff so that we can have a life of doing nothing. 
It's not what it's about. Though God provided, the Israelites still had to go out every single day and collect the manna. And on Friday, they still had to collect even double the amount of manna to make up for the fact that there wouldn't be any on the last day of the week. In other words, we are still called to work. We are called to work. This is, this is not an anti-ambition message. If that's what you think it is, you're receiving this all wrong. This is not an anti-work message. This is not a let's be couch potatoes for God message. It's not it at all. It's, it's the old story, you know, somebody loses their job and they go home and they just sit and wait for the phone to ring. And, and, and their, their justification is God knows I'm unemployed. He'll provide a job for me. Well, did you ever think that it's just possible? I know this is a radical idea. It's just possible that God's gonna provide you this job through a resume, through interviews, through an application, through actually going out and and looking for work and and networking with people. Uh, Let me frame it this way. Here's a different way of looking at it. 34 years ago, God, in a sense, provided Jackie for me. He brought her into my life. It was... It was great, I loved it. I mean, I I was absolutely slain the moment I saw her. God brought Jackie into my life, but here's the thing. I still had to practice good hygiene. I still had to get in front of her. I still had to make my move. I still had to do all of these things in order to make the connection. I was still called by God to do something. And of course, we can turn it around, flip that coin, and we can look at it the other way. God provided for Jackie these last 34 years a fun, lifelong project in me. God provides. The point is, we still have to do our part, calling, vocation, our mission, whatever it is that God made for us. Here's the third thing. Bread is also a metaphor for God's word, the Bible. God's word gives us provision of wisdom and sustenance of hope, comfort, and strength, and it points us to Jesus. Jesus quotes Deuteronomy, you know, in in Matthew chapter four, when he tells Satan, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. If you have your Bibles, turn to that first passage, Ezekiel chapter two. So, This is Ezekiel being called into ministry for God's people as they are in exile, after they have reaped the fruit of their rebellion. And you look towards the end of chapter two, here's what God is telling Ezekiel. He's gonna be God's messenger, God's prophet, God's preacher. And he says to Ezekiel, but you, son of man, hear what I say to you. Be not rebellious like that rebellious house, like all of your people, like all of my people, Israel. Open your mouth and eat what I give to you. And when I looked, Ezekiel writes, behold, a hand was stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. And he spread it before me, and it had writing on the front and on the back, and there was written on it words of lamentation and mourning and woe. And he said to me, son of man, eat whatever you find here. Eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he gave me the scroll to eat. And he said to me, son of man, feed your belly with this scroll that I might, that I give you and fill your stomach with it. Then I ate and it was in my mouth as sweet as honey. This is a picture of God's word. And and there's Jeremiah chapter 15, where Jeremiah writes these words, again, within the context of exile. Your words were found, and I ate them. And your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. And then Psalm 119 says this, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. It's told in several different places that... um, the, the, the little Jewish boys would be sent to Hebrew school or rabbi school uh, for years and years and years. And, and about when they were six years old, they would be sitting in class with the rabbi and the rabbi would be talking about the importance of God's word, the importance of the scrolls, the importance of Torah. And, and he would say, Torah is, is like honey. It's sweet to the taste. 
And then the rabbi would walk around and he would dab honey on the tongues of each of the students to remind them of how sweet this word of God is. The bread also represents the sustenance that we get from knowing God's word and knowing who God is because the word of God points us to him. Fourth, bread is even a metaphor for the faith community, for the church, for the body of Christ. It is also a metaphor for Christ's body, his actual body, yes. The, body, the, the bread that was broken for us, his body. But it's also a, a metaphor of the church. And we need this body because we were created for community. I can't tell you how many uh, emails and texts and calls I'm getting from people just saying, I, I really, I, I, here you go, I will never again take for granted Sundays at church. Being in church with people, I will never take that for granted again. We were created for community. We were created for relationship. It's one of the ways that we bear the image of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul talks about how when we eat the bread of communion, it is a needed participation in the body. Yes, in the body of Christ, but also in the church body, the, the grander body of Christ, the faith community. It's table fellowship. It's being in relationship with each other. We are image bearers of God primarily through relationship because relationship gives us sustenance and hope and life. I have a book recommendation for you if you've never read this book. Uh, it's Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning. Frankl was uh, in the Nazi uh, prison camps during World War II, and he's a psychiatrist, and he survived. He's one of the one in ten that survived. And he wrote this book uh, after he observed how important, relation, how important relationship, community, and hope are in the midst of life and sustenance and provision and actually living. I highly recommend this book, Frankel's book. And then number five, this bread represents Wisdom. And there is actually wisdom in this simple prayer of giving us this day our daily bread. Again, turn in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 30, verses 7 through 9. Here's what it says. The writer here in these three verses says this. Two things I ask of you, talking to God, praying to God. Two things I ask of you. Deny them not to me before I die. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me. Lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. It's commonly understood that the King Solomon wrote uh, the book of Proverbs, at least most of the book of Proverbs. But here in chapter 30, at the very beginning of 30, we have someone identified as Agur who is writing the sayings in chapter 30. So who is Agur? Actually, we don't know. There's, uh, there are a couple of common uh, speculations. One is that Agur was somehow a nickname for Solomon. Uh, but the second speculation, I think this is probably more likely, is that Agur was one of uh, Solomon's primary counselors, somebody who was very close to Solomon. And so he wrote a, a few of these. And it doesn't matter. It's all wisdom. It's in the Bible. It made the cut. So it's there. And also, according to the Old Testament scholar, Dwayne Garrett, uh, this, these three verses here in the entire book of Proverbs, 31 chapters long, is the only prayer. It's the only place where there's a prayer found in the book of Proverbs. So imagine that. In all 31 of these chapters, th this is the only prayer that's offered in the midst of, of Proverbs. And it sounds an awful lot like this section of the Lord's Prayer, does it not? He says, two things I ask of you, God. And he says, give them to me before I die. Kind of sounds like an ancient bucket list, right? But there's only two things on this guy's bucket list. Just two things that's it. And think about what they are. He, he's not saying, you know, before I die, I've got to jump out of an airplane. I've, I've got to see the Eiffel Tower. I've got to finish a marathon. I, I hope I get to watch the Suns win an NBA championship. Those are on my, you know, a lot of people, that, that's your bucket list. No, 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 no. Does anyone have on their bucket list at all two items that look like this? Here's what he says. He says, I don't want any deceit to be part of my life. 
And I don't want the false god of wealth to be available for me to worship. That's his bucket list. So first he says, I don't want to be a liar, and I don't want anybody to lie to me. It's kind of a golden rule thing. I, I, I won't lie to you, now you don't lie to me. Do unto others and all that. And that's a good prayer. That's, that's a good desire. Think about it. What does deception destroy for us? Well, it destroys trust, security, hope, sustenance, relationship, community. That's a good prayer. Second of all, he wants his trust to be only in God and not in wealth. He says, you know, if I have too much, I'm going to assume that I don't need God. So that means I'm trusting in my wealth. I'm trusting in stuff. That's materialism. Now, now a guru is not saying here that stuff is bad. He's not saying that material goods are bad. He just prays that he never puts his faith in those things. He doesn't want a false god. See, this prayer is not an anti-material prayer, but it is an anti-materialism prayer. He, he's praying against a false god. But also he prays, if I have too little, I might become a criminal. That's simply another way of, of trusting not in God, but trusting in stuff. So he presents his second request as two sides of the same coin. It's the false God coin. It's the false God of stuff coin. When Jesus teaches us to pray for our daily bread, it reminds us of where our trust is supposed to lie. It's not supposed to lie in hoarding or in quantity or in accumulation. And it's not supposed to lie. Our trust is not supposed to lie in, in our own supposed ability to make things happen and control outcomes. This is a prayer that Jesus calls to us to trust in God. Again, Jesus in, in John chapter six, he says, I am the bread of life, trust in me. It is also a prayer that calls us to obedience and to our part in this process, but to trust God for the results. So finally, I want to wrap up by talking about one other thing. Call it a bonus item, item number six, if you will. What about contentment in the midst of all of this? I, I don't think there's any way to talk about this part of the prayer without at least having some words about contentment. So turn to Philippians chapter four. Philippians chapter four, starting at verse 10. It's funny, in my Bible, this is actually titled by the translators. Uh, this section of the, of the scriptures is titled God's Provision, so it fits here. So here's what Paul writes. <clears throat> He's writing to the church at Philippi, and he writes these words. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Here's what Paul is saying. I received a financial gift from you so that I can sustain my ministry and sustain my life. Uh, he, he, that's, that's his way of saying, he's, you, you showed your concern by reaching out and giving me this gift. And, and he also said, it's not that you weren't concerned when you weren't sending money, you just didn't have the money to send during that time, but now you do, and I appreciate the fact that you've decided to send me some money. Here you go. Sometimes God's provision comes from God's people. We need to understand that's why the church and the community is so important. That's why the, the community of faith is so important, that sometimes God provides for us and sustains for us through his other people that we know. That's what Paul is saying here, and he continues. Verse 11, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned. Contentment is something you learn. It's not a spiritual gift. You have to learn it. I have learned whatever situation I am in to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In, every, in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance, and need. In other words, no matter what I have, if I'm on the top of the world or if I'm in the worst valley of my life, the worst trench, I, I have no problem with that. I'm content because I can do all things through him, Christ Jesus, who strengthens me. He continues, yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. You sent me some money, some help. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. This is one of the reasons why I, I think Paul has a, a, an affinity with Philippians because they shared in his ministry burn, his ministry passion. 
He says, even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. And he says, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. When you give, there's, there's a gospel fruit that comes from that. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And then verse 19, the payoff verse, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. No, notice that every need will be supplied, but it'll be according to God's glory and not ours. That's why we have to be very careful about reclassifying wants as needs because God knows what we truly need and what we need more than anything is him. This passage is, is fascinating to me, not only because God, we, we see in this that God often supplies us our daily bread through his people, indirectly, so to speak. But think of it this way. Martin Luther, the great reformer, wrote this 500 years ago. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we ask God to give us this day our daily bread. And he does it by means of the farmer who planted and harvested the grain, the baker who made the flour into bread, and the person who prepared our meal. Isn't that beautiful? It's so true. So here you go. You've endured this message all the way to here. And I know it's been a journey. But here is where I think it's incumbent on us as the church, as the people of God, and as the leadership of this church to, number one, be thankful for the fact that we can still go to places like Safeway or Sprouts or Trader Joe's or Whole Foods because there are people working in there and there are people there who are exposing themselves to this virus on a daily basis and we don't have to. And I know some of you say, I'd rather be working at Safeway than stuck at home. I get that. So apply to Safeway. Go ahead. That's a good idea. They're looking for people. But we need to remember that there are people out there doing a job in the face of what can be pretty dangerous situations. Healthcare workers, people in hospitals, uh, police officers, fire department, people in grocery stores. They're doing a job for us and we can thank them. But here's another place where we need to direct our thanks and our gratitude. And this is coming from the leadership of Redemption Church. Uh, most of you have continued with your giving support of the church, even though the times we live in are a little bit treacherous and we're unsure about what's going forward. And we sincerely thank you for your financial support, for your willingness to step up and give during this time, recognizing that maybe you have a surplus right now and there are others who don't, and that is a beautiful gospel-centered thing that you are doing, and we are grateful, and we are thankful, and we are humbled by all of that. And we just wanted to be able to say that. Again, we need to hear this. I think this is important. This message is, and this prayer is not anti-ambition. It's not anti-ambition. We need to work. But at the end of the day, it is telling us that at the end of the day, when we've done all we can do, and we are sitting down in front of Netflix or, or Amazon Prime or Ticket to Ride or whatever it is that we're doing, we can look around and we can say, you know what? I'm content. I'm okay. I'm good with who I am. I'm good with who I'm with. I'm good with what I have. And I'm good with what I'm doing and what I'm going to do. I'm good with all of those things. I'm content. Give us this day our daily bread. I, I know that when we started this series, there were a few people in the leadership of Redemption at Large who were like, we're going to take six weeks to go through that short little section of Scripture. It's just verses 9 through 13. Are we going to find enough to talk about? I think we're finding enough to talk about, are we not? We are. And I think this is worth saying as our wrap today. All of us have a deep hunger, a deeper hunger than our stomachs. That deeper hunger is our souls, and it's God who provides for that hunger. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for your word and its truth, and we thank you for your prayer. This prayer that you have given to us so that it can be uh, not just the Lord's Prayer, but the disciples' prayer, that we can pray it. And I pray that we would pray this prayer with confidence and with a sense of dependency. So help us to be able to do that. We are your people, and we love you, and we thank you even in the midst of difficult uh, and, and, and challenging times. We thank you for who you are 
and how you've saved us through your son, Jesus Christ. And we pray that in his name. Amen.